just give you a moment to find it. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him, and have seen him. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus saith unto him, Have you been so long with, have I been so long a time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believeth me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And what service you shall ask in my name, that will I do. The Father may glory, be glorified in the Son, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth that the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Well, if you have your Bibles tonight, turn to that reading that we had together, and our text is taken from one verse, and perhaps we can all uh, read it together. It's the New King James Version. I'll say it once, and then you can repeat it after me. It's something which the Lord Jesus Christ impressed upon his disciples. It's in the 15th verse of uh, John's Gospel, where he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. We could say that, can't we? If you love me, keep my commandments. And there's a word which God has given to his church and to his people. And they are words filled with love. There is an appeal of love within these very words. And what happens is this, is that uh, there are times in our lives when I'm sure people have made an appeal of love uh, to us. Someone may have said at some time, if you love me, you wouldn't say that. Or if you love me, you wouldn't do that. Or if you love me, you would buy me that. <laughs> or if you love me. So the Lord Jesus Christ comes here and says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in this section, as you know, of that night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, it is filled with love. You find it there in John chapter 13 and verse 1, where it says, uh, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. You find it again there in verse 23 of chapter 13. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And then you, you find it again in verse then uh, 34. A new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. And those are not just words which are being spoken. On that night where the Lord Jesus had gathered his disciples around, there was a profound display of his great care for them and his devotion to them. Can you imagine what it must have been like when the Lord Jesus Christ took that towel and then began to wash the disciples' feet and uh, to touch them and to minister to them, uh, to bow down and to take of their very needs. But that wasn't the end, was it? 
what happens then? He comes and he starts taking bread and he breaks it and he says, uh, now take eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And then you find it again uh, throughout this uh, very chapter where he is calling his people in verse then 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And when a person becomes a Christian, look, we become a Christian, we know, by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is that element where you also know that being a Christian at the very foundation of it all is that you are someone who is to love the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. That's what the great gospel is about, the great love of God, which has then been given to us. And if that's not in our lives, there is something seriously wrong. You know what Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, although they had many things which were right, but they had lost their first love. And the very first commandment that God then gives us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And when a person becomes a Christian, remember it is by faith alone which is in him. But this is what it says in Galatians. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And when, as I said, a person becomes a Christian, you can only become a Christian by faith alone. Absolutely by faith alone. It is that ingredient by which we take hold and know of salvation. But when it comes to love, it is that ingredient which is essential for obedience. And if anyone is going to be obedient to the very things of Christ, you need to know that within one's heart and in one's mind. And I don't want to shock you, but perhaps it's worth us thinking again tonight that on that night, although we're saved by faith alone, he tells us these words, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Can you have it there? He who has my commandments will keep them. And it is he who loves me. And when you find this account, not only does he repeat the very fact of his love to us and, and we to him, he repeats time and time again. Chapter 15. Keep my commandments. Do those things that I've called you then uh, to do. And, and tonight, there's just simply two points when we come to this text and to remember. And first of all, it's that little question. If you love me, that's what I would like to put to you. If you love me. And uh, do you do that tonight? Do you know that in your experience and in your heart? Now, this address is only to those who do love him. Don't think for a moment that Jesus is addressing you for one moment that you should keep his commandments if you don't love him. It's impossible to even begin to want to walk that road. For anyone here tonight who has a desire, perhaps, or believes that you need to keep his commandments and that you try to do it, you will end up in the same state as Martin Luther ended up. He did his best to do those works. And in the end, his great statement was this. I didn't love God. I hated him. I hated him because the burdens were so great and the commandments are, are so heavy and no one's going to begin tonight to even suggest to you that you would come to such a place where you think that you could keep these commandments and Jesus knows that. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And what happens is that when a person becomes a Christian, is that you begin to realize, don't you, of the great love of God and the great work in which he has done. And when you think that he gave his only begotten son and you begin to realize of the sheer unconditional love which he has for us and the grace he has poured on us and the things he has endured for us 
and you begin to hear of the gospel that if only you believe in him, you shall be saved for eternity and you'll know of heaven and bliss and you'll know of glory. Well, when someone comes to know that, yes, you know what happens. Although you've come to him by faith, you have that love which is poured in. Where do you begin to thank him? I know it's uh, not Christmas, but to quote that Christmas hymn, what could I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would uh, give a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I have, I give. I give him my heart. And let me say again, that in this very place, these words are not to anyone here. Although it may be that you have come to this place and you uh, in this place, there is no way that this is now spoken to you. And I'll tell you why. If you love me, keep my commands. If there's one thing that's gone wrong in the church, and in the Church of Wales, we've had a whole generation and generations upon people trying to do Christian things with the misery and the burden and the heartache and it's done no favours for the gospel and no favours for God. People turn up in a place of worship and you know the big long little you know sulks and the torture of the Lord's day and trying to communicate the things of God and instead of being winsome and uh, instead of being that which would draw people in it's been one which has been one hard miserable slog and uh, there is no way God wants you to go and witness with a face as long as a horse and he doesn't want you to come in any shape or a manner which will come and but those who love him would you come and you you keep his commandments and again can I say to you tonight that uh, when the Lord Jesus, because I don't know, we're, we're, wherever we are in our Christian walk, notice what he does not say. And it is important because I need to ask you that question. There may be those of you, you're unsure where you are. In the things of God and with him, just ask you this. Do you love him? Now, do you know him? Now, to know him is to love him. But he doesn't say, if you know me, keep my commandments. He doesn't even say, if you trust me, keep my commandments. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And there's something in that. Because in one's life and where we find ourselves is that this is what will be generated in all these commandments that God gives and the things that he wants us to do, they are not burdensome to the one, you see, who, who has an affection and has a desire. It's, it's part and the pulse of the Christian experience and the Christian life that you would know that. It's just something of what you would naturally do in one sense. I was uh, going through these things uh, just the other day on one of these, uh, I suppose it was Facebook or something like that, and scrolling down and there was, and there was one there which uh, said, do you want to be, you know, more loving to your partner? Do you want to grow in a, a mutual, <laughs> you know, greater love to one another? And all you had to do was, you know, to, to click on, you know, just press the little click and then I'm sure then I'd be sent to a, a you know, a kind of website where, you know, there'd be someone who'll tell me how you could be more affectionate, you know, to your wife uh, in a very special way. I didn't click on to it and I'll tell you why. Because I didn't want to read the adverts, that was one. And then I thought to myself, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. You love someone. You want to be with them. You love someone, you see. You want to do those things which are pleasing to them. You, if you love them, you will think of them. And it's as simple as that. 
And when the Lord Jesus Christ now comes, and as he calls them, he calls them to this very place, and he says, well, if you do, if you do, you will keep my commandments. And for those who have become a Christian, that is something, perhaps tonight, I, I hope that, that you know in your experience, it's, it's almost impossible not to know this, this great passion that you truly will have for him. I mean, I know there will be those here and say, well, Mr. Rees, uh, no one loves me. No one cares for me. Well, in one sense, I, I'm not even caring about that tonight. What one cares about is this. Do you love him? And you've got a desire to be with him and a desire to, to be as close to him as you possibly can in that hymn that we just sang together where, or how does it go? And it tells us about immortal honours that rest on Jesus' head. And then it speaks, does it not, of uh, all that I, my soul would praise and love him more. His beauties trace, his majesty adore. On him to lean, on his bosom lean, and to do all his will adore. And that's your desire. It was the desire of the hymn writer, is that to, to lean near his breast and to do his will and to adore him. And a person who wants that in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to be as close to him as one possibly can. I don't want to have distance between him in any way. I want to be with him in that hymn that uh, we are going to sing. O oh, Saviour, thy dying love, thou gavest me, nor should I aught withhold in love for thee. In love my soul would bow, my heart fulfil its vow. Some offering bring thee now, something for thee. That's just the first point. We're talking to people here. If you love me. And um, what else can you do when you've come to him and he has forgiven you and you know he died for you and you know that he cares for you and you know that uh, he has blessed you in a way you cannot even begin to imagine. Your response is that he would be your first love in your life. That's very simple. But then there's the second uh, aspect to this sentence. And I want us to mark it down. Keep my commandments. And uh, what's interesting about the Lord Jesus Christ is that when you read about him, there are many commandments in this book. Lots of them. I mean, it's filled with commandments. But the Lord Jesus Christ had his commandments that he wanted to give to his people. Now, over the last number of months, we've been doing a series in Luke's Gospel. And we spent 16 weeks in chapter 12. Chapter 12. Going through those verses. And what came out from those verses was this. The sheer number of commands that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to his disciples. He commands them not to worry about the things you should eat and drink and the things you should wear. He commands them that you seek first the kingdom of God. He commands them to keep their lamps burning. He commands them to, to be ready for service. He, he commands them. And when you go through it, it's filled with imperatives. And you say, why is that filled with imperatives? Well, I tell you why, because when the Lord Jesus Christ is on earth, he hears someone who is God incarnate. He comes and he speaks with authority. 
He doesn't just suggest these things and gives little stories. He comes and he tells them in the most mundane things, command after command after command. And now he tells them, if you remember when he rose again from the dead and he gives them that commission to go into uh, all the world. And I wonder if it was on the same mount where he spoke the Sermon on the Mount. He says, I want you to go baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them all that I have commanded you to observe. Uh, don't forget anyone. Tells us in John chapter 5, every commandment I give unto you. And now he tells them, you love me, keep my commandments. And I just want to pick on tonight the ones which are mentioned here in this context, which we know about, which are immediate, which are now in the forefront of then their minds. And you can't help but as we come to this table where he says to them, and he has taken bread, and he says, do this in remembrance of me. That is my command. And there is a place in our lives where we are followers of him and we are believers in him and where we want to please him that there must be in our experience the desire that we will simply remember him, not forget him and the great work which he did. And that is a command which is upon us. Now, I want to just say to you, we're living in days of sheer low spiritual levels. We're living in days where commitment and the pleasures of the world and the things all around us have, have taken us away from the things of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he gives his commands, they are never grievous. When Jesus Christ commands, his commands are those which will truly bless you. They are those which will help you. The Lord Jesus Christ, he loves you. And he wants you now to, to know blessing in one's life. And when he says, do this in remembrance of me, because he knows that every one of us in this place, there's one place every one of us needs to remember. We're never to live far from it. We're never to live far from his cross and from his sufferings and from his death. And wherever we've been in our lives, he is calling us back to remember what he has done, the blood which he has shed, the forgiveness which we can receive. And when he gives us this command, what better command could you have? This is not burdensome to the Christian to remember the Lord Jesus and all that he is and all that he has done these things are wonderful to us, but we need them. You need them. You need them like this. We are sick. We are unhealthy. We are weak. We are people who have lost our spiritual hunger and thirst. And you know, when the Lord comes, this is a command where, in a sense, he knows that we need the food and we need the medicine. I don't know, perhaps some of you have had the experience where, look, you may have had someone who's ill and sick and uh, there's medicine to take and there are things that they need to eat and it, it breaks your heart to, to see them in that condition. But for some reason, things go wrong in people's minds and thinking, perhaps even in little children. They won't take the medicine. They won't eat the food. And then the mother comes. The mother comes. And when the mother comes, the mother comes, they know the mother loves them. Although they don't want to take, they know that the mother can deal with them and come and take and uh, take the medicine. Do it. Do it for me. Do it for me. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes in, in this very place, he, he is a command which he gives unto us. And you say, you love me? You, you, you do love me? Do this now. 
in remembrance of me. And I assure you tonight, in that very act, there's the, the means of grace where Jesus Christ has promised, as we believe, as faith comes through the preaching of the word, so in the coming to this table, he strengthens us, establishes us, builds us up in the very things of the faith. What a command. You love me, don't you? Now come here. Take. It's my body broken for you. It's my blood which is shed for you. You come here. You come here. And then you've got this. There's that other command which he has given. Uh, just remember, you will keep my commandments. Now this must be in their minds, because in verse 34 of chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you love one another. And in that now, there is this where Jesus Christ, as you know, he loved them to the end. And um, if I could put it like this, if you belong to Jesus Christ tonight, Jesus Christ loves you. And Jesus Christ is concerned that other people of his children will love you. And he wants others to care for you as he has cared for you. And in this place of, of a church, he has a great concern. Look, his commands are not burdensome in any shape or any form. What happens is, is that you've been given this new command, a person who becomes a Christian, part of this family of God, and then he, he shows them in a great way, in an incredible way. You find it there, do you not? I think it's in verse, look, in verse 10, he says, if you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my father's commands and abide in his love. In verse 12 of chapter 15, this is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. And there in our Christian experience, do you know there is something that he expects from the life of the church, from your own experience, and it is of an extreme kind, as he tells us, as I have done it, as I have ministered to you, uh, washed one another's feet, uh, made myself the lowest, uh, taken that position, given my life even for you. Look, you love him, don't you? Yes, I do, I do. Yes, I do. Love his people. Love his people. Now look, church life can be very difficult. No one denies it. And um, we're all humans. We've all got sins and we've, we've all got problems. But you just got to keep it in your mind. This person may be very nasty, unfriendly, obnoxious even at times, and they may not be very loving towards you. Could you not just put this into your mind? Although I may find this very difficult, I love Jesus. I love him. And because I love him, I am now going to love my brother and my sister. And when it comes to a place where people can do awful things uh, to us, remember this, always be loving. Always love them. There's no other plan that you've got. You're not going to say, I think about it. It may be not quite now. You want to be with Jesus. You want to abide with him. You want to be as close to him as you can. And because of that, you're going to take the blows and the knocks. And you know that this is his way. And uh, because that he has shown that to you, not that you've got it in yourself, but as then he has loved you, you will come and you will forgive them and you will help them and you will pray for them and you will do that. Now God's got a command. He's got a command for the church of Bethesda. Love one another. You love him, don't you? 
And uh, so he says, you keep my commands. Look, there's, there's another command that he's given them. Just before this, you find it there in verse uh, 13 and 14. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And, and then you've got uh, these uh, very words where he tells us of how we come to him and abide with him. And when you go through this section seven times in the final discourse, he, he, he encourages them, he tells them to pray in my name, in my name. And you know, there's another wonderful command that he gives. Would you not pray to him that as he tells us here, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And when you read this account, in the final words which he was giving, he was saying, ask of me. Pray the Father. He will send you another comforter. Seven times. And in that now, he gives an imperative that you must do this. And you know that's a wonderful means of grace. Like I said, if you do love someone, you want to be with them. And that's why he says, if you do, keep this command. You come and talk to me. You speak to me. You uh, come and pray. You do that because he has a wonderful, wonderful uh, wanting his father to be glorified. And there's not anything that glorifies the father more than his people who call upon him and pray to him. Now, when God's our love goes weak. What's the first thing that goes? You know it. What's the first thing that's gone in any church? Now let's make it plain. It's as plain as day. You are to pray to God, both privately and publicly as a church. Without question. Jesus told them, commanded them, to wait for him, to pray, to minister, to come together, to bear those burdens. He's told them, you know that. And one of the great Ten Commands. And it is the wonderful because you know that's the way that God again has brought his grace towards us. There are means of grace in our lives that we can know the power of God. We can know the answers to prayer. We can know what it is to have communion then with him. And he says, look, you do love me. You pray. You pray in my name. And he's going to give great glory to the Father. Great glory to him. Now there is one more command that he gives. But he doesn't actually give it in this portion. But in everything I said fulfills the great commission. So for example in John chapter 15 and verse 16. You did not choose me. Now, now remember now, here it is about prayer, really connected. But I chose you, I appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask in the Father, in my name he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Now let me just say this fourth command, which the Lord gives. I know it's on the board there with the world before us. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, it may be that we have not gone into all the world to preach the gospel, but every one of us is called to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we have this service, let me show you how important this service is in our witness and testimony to the truths of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. You say, but you know me, Chris, I've been here long enough. I'm not the greatest evangelist which has ever lived. He has given you a command to do and you love him and it can begin here. As often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, till he comes. When you gather round 
in this community, in this place, is a powerful testimony that you're making tonight. That that blood of Calvary is of insignificance and of importance unto you. And that you know that by that very suffering and blood that you are those which are saved. And when you come together, you're giving that testimony. Shall I give you another one? Here it is, found there in chapter 13. If you love one another, verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, second, here it is. When you come together, you come around the Lord's table, you're one with another, difficulties there may be, forgiveness which is shown, bitterness is taken out, things are repented of, relationships are made, and as you come and minister, what a powerful testimony, not just to some, but by this, all men will know, you belong to me, and that in him, the king of love my shepherd is, and we are his servants here tonight, and we belong unto him, and when you come to the table, and you're with one another, the powerful testimony of his great then master, which he is over us. We haven't finished, have we? As you find it there in verse uh, 16. I chose you for this. What did I choose you for? I chose you that whatever you ask from the Father, you will bear much fruit. And when you come, and as a church, you say, I'm not the greatest evangelist there's ever been. But when you come here, and then you begin to pray, and offer those, by this there will be fruit which will be born. It won't even be, perhaps even through the preaching, but through the praying, God has his, his ways. Now, it's the fact, I know that we're saved by faith alone. No one denies that. And faith is what you need to be saved. But love is what we need for obedience, which is unto him. And when you come, you, we, we come and may God do something in our lives tonight by which we will know of that and we'll have a greater desire. And no matter how weak we may be, he, he's got his, our interests at heart. He, he's concerned, even for ourselves, that you will receive those blessings which which he wants you to have, ask, and the Father will give it, and people will, will care for you. And in this world, where there's poison and difficulty out there, you make sure that you, you're, you're good to, to one another. And uh, you know that although our hearts have gone so cold, come to me, remember me, that this may burn once again, deep in our souls. Uh, if we love him, we will keep those commands.